that in 2008 you told Andrew Denton that you didn't think that people should be interested in you, but you hoped they might be, that you might have something interesting to say about the world. So now we have this beautiful book in which we have been allowed to be interested in you and have that interest slaked. What has led you to be so generous as to share yourself with us? It's even worse than that. I've even now just about finished volume two, which is, which, uh, um, why did I change my mind? I think I'm going to have to be absolutely honest and say the publishers persuaded me to. <laughs> Not a very honorable reason, perhaps, but um, I, I did enjoy writing it. Uh, I enjoyed very much talking to my mother, uh, who, whose 98th birthday was two days ago. Uh, and when she... I'm Let's sure she, I'm sure she'd appreciate hand, that. Absolutely. Um, and so I was able to tap her very um, good memory of, of my earliest childhood. And there are even some extracts from her diaries uh, in there. Oh. Uh, she also and some beautiful illustrations beautiful illustrations by her and she's a very good writer as well actually mm. um, and I I didn't formally interview her but I had many many conversations with her about my childhood and that was that was fun I, I enjoyed that I mean I, I enjoyed um, trying to re revive memories which I did uh, and so I enjoyed writing about childhood uh, and um, so Sorry if I changed my mind, but I did actually end up quite enjoying it. No, I actually, I, like I, I said, I think it's a beautiful, I actually see it as quite a beautiful transition because I, I felt like during that interview, you, you didn't seem to be expressing what I knew would have been true because of course all the people watching it did think you were extremely interesting, not just for what you had to say about science, but for you. And it seems like quite a wonderful personal journey to me to come to a place where you can acknowledge that you are interesting to others. Yes, I'm trying to remember back to that interview. Was he the one who asked me my star sign? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I think my exasperation probably showed on my face. Didn't it? <laughs> a little. Yes. <laughs> a little. Now, you were born in Kenya, and your early years seemed quite idyllic, at least as, as it came across to me and off the page. You have a younger sister, two loving and seemingly quite happily married parents. And after reading your book, in fact, a Guardian reviewer pondered whether such happy childhoods produce scientists while fraught families turn out novelists. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose I did have a happy childhood. Um, you have to set that against being sent to, to boarding school at the mm. age of seven. Tell us uh, about that. Which is um, too young. Uh, I suppose, but it was the kind of thing that happened to people like, I mean, that people like my, my parents did. It had happened to my father as well. He was sent to school at the age of, to, to sent abroad actually, because his parents were in Burma uh, at the age of seven. He probably took it very stoically, if I know him. Um, I, well, just to give one tiny illustration, I would daily fantasize that the matron would turn into my mother. In, um, yes, and in fact, can you read us, because I found that quite a poignant um, fantasy about the oh. matron. So I okay. thought maybe you could read to us from here. From there, just that down bit. to the bottom of the page. Yeah, and I think it flips over a little bit. Okay, the, the school was called the Eagle School, and it was an offshoot of a school in Oxford, uh, which is called the Dragon School. It's rather a famous one a housemaster from the Dragon School went out to what was then Southern Rhodesia and founded a boys' prep school rather on the lines of the Dragon School. In addition to its school song and motto, Eagle took over the Dragon School's tradition of calling the teachers by their nicknames or Christian names. We all called the headmaster Tank, even when being punished by him. At the time, I thought the name meant the sort of tank that holds water in your roof, but I now realize that it almost certainly referred to the relentlessly unstoppable military vehicle. Probably Mr. Carey acquired, during his years at the Dragon, a reputation for dogged persistence, moving forward in a straight line regardless of obstacles. Other masters were Claude, also a migrant from the Dragon, Dick, who had the popular duty of handing out a blessed ration of chocolate during our afternoon rest every Wednesday, and Paul, a darkly jovial Hungarian who taught French. 
Mrs. Watson, who taught the most junior boys, was Watty, and the matron, Miss Copleston, was Coppers. I cannot pretend that I was happy at Eagle, but I was probably as happy as a seven-year-old sent away from home for three months can expect to be. Most poignant was the fantasy which I think I indulged almost daily when Coppers used to do her quiet morning rounds of the dormitories and we were still dozing. I imagined that she would somehow magically be transformed into my mother. I prayed incessantly for this. Coppers had dark curly hair like my mother. So in my childish naivety, I reasoned that it wouldn't have taken a very big miracle to effect the transformation. And I was sure the other boys would like my mother just as much as we all like coppers. It's beautiful. And, and it was very moving because, you, I mean, you care deeply about children. And in fact, you show a lot of both stoicism um, during the telling of these stories. Um, but also, I could sense through the stoicism that those years of being sent away weren't perhaps as happy as they might have been. No, that's probably true. By the way, I've just remembered Coppers' first report on me at the end of term, which said Dawkins has only three speeds, slow, very slow, and stop. <laughs> <laughs> and so did those experiences, despite, I mean, and, and through, you know, of course, you're, you're telling both the ups and downs, but overall, do you feel that, because it is such an English tradition, do you feel that children should be sent away to boarding school? No, I do not think they should be sent away to boarding school. I, I mean, my, my mother actually now feels quite guilty about it. She often, she often says so. It just was the thing that that kind of person did at the time. I don't think it ever crossed their mind to do anything else. And so I don't resent it. Uh, but I think it, it clearly is too young. So Richard, one of the interesting things that I came across when I was doing the research for this um, interview is one thing I thought I knew definitely about you was that you were an atheist. And then I started reading and then I started listening to clips. And what I discovered was, in fact, at different times, you have not um, necessarily felt that that was the right description for you. So for instance, at one point, you had an interesting interview with someone who the person who kindly put the clip on YouTube unfortunately never named, so we'll just have to call him Blogs. Um, but you had a very interesting debate with Blogs in which you said, you could possibly persuade me that there was some kind of creative force in the universe. There is some kind of physical, mathematical genius who'd created everything. The expanding universe, devised quantum theory, relativity, and all that. You could possibly persuade me of that. And on Q&A, you said, and this was probably just a few years ago, that you vacillate about thinking that atheist is, is the correct way to describe yourself, or given your um, sensitivity of, to the importance of the scientific method and, and the need for a modesty about what we can and can't know definitively, that maybe that's not the right term. So can you tell me where you're sitting today? Yes. Um, I think we're really talking terminology here. Um, I, I don't remember exactly who that interviewer, w was it an interview or, or an he argument? Was a, no, he was a, I think he was probably a religious person. Oh, I know who you mean. I think his name of... is John Lennox. Okay. Um, did he have a, a strong Northern Irish accent? He did indeed. Yes, okay. Yes. This was John Lennox, and thereby hangs quite a revealing and interesting tale, actually, which I'll tell before okay. answering your question. Um, I... Uh, had had a previous encounter, well, two previous encounters with John Lennox, in one of which I had assumed that he was a sophisticated theologian who therefore would not believe in things like the virgin birth, turning water into wine, walking on water, that kind of so thing. So not a literalist. That's right. Not a, and so I paid him the compliment of saying, well, obviously, I, I assume you don't believe in the virgin birth. I assume you don't believe in... Jesus turned water into wine, but he interrupted me and said, yes, I do believe in those things. Um, and I was rather astonished, and I pressed him on it and made sure he really, really did believe it. He really did believe those things. So then, uh, that was a radio interview. And then later, I, I encountered him under the same auspices in the Oxford University Museum, which was filmed, and that's the one that you saw. Okay. Uh, and I began by saying, that uh, 
I, I, I might be prepared to believe in a deistic God, a kind of um, divine physicist or mathematician who set up the laws of physics and solved all the, the, the deep, deep problems of where the laws of physics come from and then stood back and let, and let things happen. Um, I could be persuaded of that, I think was the phrase that you just mm. quoted. Um, it's not a thing that I believe, but I would not think that that was a totally silly belief to hold. And can, How, you, can you expand on that? Why wouldn't that be a silly belief to well, hold? Well, okay, I'll do that in a, in a moment. Sure. But, but I, I said that in order to contrast it with what I already knew John Lennox believed. So what I was trying to do was to uh, emphasize the absurdity of John Lennox's belief in turning water into wine by making a contrast with the kind of deistic belief which I could just about take seriously, but I was very careful to say that I did not actually hold that deistic belief. Mm, mm. But I wanted to emphasize the contrast. I called it mining the Eddington concession, and I have to explain that. Um, Eddington, who was a great physicist, uh, wanted to emphasize the absolute importance of the second law of thermodynamics. And he did it by contrasting it, this is the Eddington concession, by contrasting it with something else, which he also uh, stood by, but less strongly. He said, your theory may be at odds with Maxwell's equations. Well, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. Of course, he didn't really mean that. And then he said, your theory may be falsified by experiment. Well, these experimentalists do bungle things from time to time. But if your theory goes against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. Right. So his entire point was that the second law of thermodynamics was a more inviolable theory than even Maxwell's equations and even experimental physics. Mm. So he was not saying that he didn't believe in Maxwell's equations. Mm. He was not saying that he thought that experimental physics was a lot, a lot of rubbish. He was using that in order to make the rhetorical point that there was something really, really special about the second law of thermodynamics. Sure. I was doing, I was mining the Eddington concession okay. with John Lennox. I was saying, I could just about be persuaded to believe in a deistic God who, who made the laws of physics, but if you're going to believe in water turning into wine, I can offer you no hope. Okay, so what you're saying, in other words, is you, you, you would prefer not to sort of explain to us why it is that you believe that, because really it was just a rhetorical I was really just flourish. doing an Eddington concession, but, right. but the story goes on. The very next, I think it was two days later, John Lennox went up to Scotland, went up to Inverness, and made a speech on his own. And it happened that I had a close friend living in Inverness, and she went to the lecture and took very detailed, meticulous notes. And John Lennox said, two days ago in Oxford, I heard Richard Dawkins admit. <laughs> <laughs> well, it caught my attention too. E exactly. Right. Um, so so I do was, you still use that rhetorical I, flourish? I, I, I've actually, I actually prepared a lecture called Mining the Eddington Concession, oh, right. <laughs> in which to an audience of atheists, I warned people against doing it. <laughs> um, because it so can no, be, it can be, it it can be misused. Yes. It, it can be misused. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't mind expanding on the deistic po point uh, because I've now fully explained that I don't actually believe that there is a deistic God who, who um, started the laws of physics, but that is less absurd than a theistic God who reads your thoughts, answers your prayers, forgives your sins, walks on water, uh, is born of a virgin, etc. Okay, here's another question for you. Um, you've been criticized by various religious intellectuals on the infinite regress problem of the who made God question, and perhaps when you answer the question you can explain to everybody what that infinite regress problem is. They say you made a simple category error by assuming that God isn't able to transcend this type of limit by existing outside the universe. What's your response? And that came from Paul Mackey. Okay, well that carries on very nicely from the previous point actually. Um, because if we, if we imagine this deistic God 
who set up the laws of physics and the constants of, f of physics. It is, it is undoubtedly true that physicists have yet to fully explain the origin of the cosmos, the origin of the laws of physics. Um, it's undoubtedly true that uh, many physicists at least say that the, the fundamental constants of the universe, uh, things like the gravitational constant, the, uh, the um, weak force um, constant and so on, that these are highly tuned in such a way that if any of them were slightly different, if you imagine them as being sort of rheostat knobs that you can twiddle, um, if any of the, say, half dozen knobs, which are the fundamental constants of the universe, were twiddled ever so slightly different from the way they actually are, then the universe as we know it would not have come into existence. There would be no galaxies, there'd be no stars, there'd be no elements, there'd be no chemistry, there'd be no life. So the universe, according to them, is very, very fine-tuned. And this leads some people to say, therefore, there must have been a tuner. There must have been a divine physicist who carefully adjusted these knobs to exactly the right values in order to give rise to matter and galaxies and stars and um, ele elements and chemistry and evolution and life. And of course, partially what they're trying to do is, is they end up in a trap a bit because if, if the problem is, well, somebody had to have tuned it, yeah. then the question then becomes, well, who created the somebody? Exactly, and that's, that's the regress that the questioner mm. is, ta is talking about. Because it seems to me that this is an utter, utter non-explanation. It, 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 it may be true that we, we lack an explanation for the fine-tuning of these half-dozen knobs, but, in, but to postulate a, a tuner, a, knob, a divine knob twiddler, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you know why they laughed. <laughs> Who had the savvy, the knowledge, the genius to get the to work out in advance exactly where all those knobs had to be. You are postulating an entity who has got to be an entity of the very kind of thing that we're trying to explain anyway. The whole point of my subject, which is Darwinian biology, is to explain the existence of complicated things like us. We are capable of doing calculations, of working out uh, in advance how to set our rear stats and how to tune our computers and so on. We're capable of doing that. We have come into existence by an evolutionary process which Darwin and his successors explained. If you are going to postulate an intelligence, a highly advanced, complicated intelligence capable of designing a universe, then you have completely undercut the entire enterprise. You've cheated. That's all the only word I can use for it. You, you've cheated by postulating an entity of the very kind that you're trying to explain. When you add to that that he's not only got to be a brilliant physicist and mathematician, he's also got to be capable of listening to everybody's thoughts, listening to their prayers, forgiving their sins, curing some of them of cancer and not others, <laughs> etc. So um, I don't think of it as, I mean, the, the, the questioner, and was, was that a Twitter um, thing? Yeah. The questioner um, is trying to say, well, theologians have always said that God lies outside the universe and therefore is not governed by these uh, normal considerations. What a pathetic cop-out <laughs> to just simply say by fiat, to rule by fiat, that the explanation which they are offering to get out of the infinite regress is simply decided by them because theologians just say, oh, well, he's outside the laws of physics, and so we don't need to explain And does it even really get out of the problem? I never even understood how it oh. got out of the problem because some, somebody still had to put it, no, him I mean, into existence. It's, it's just a cowardly evasion. It's, that's all it is. Okay, we don't like it. Yeah. We, we zap it. Um, so okay, I, can I just one, one oh, more absolutely. thing on that? Um, there's a theologian in Oxford called Swinburne who even goes too far as to say that God is infinitely simple and therefore doesn't fall foul of this, of, the, of this problem. So any problem that you have that you can't solve, you say, God did it, 
And that's not a problem because God's infinitely simple, and that's, that's all there is to it. He actually says that you need God in order to keep every single fundamental particle, every electron, every proton, every quark. Uh, he's got his fingers on every one of them, and he's controlling them. He's controlling every single particle in the universe, but he's simple. <laughs> and he loves you. Right. <laughs> Copyright George Carlin. <laughs> so philosopher John Rawls describes something called the paradox of tolerance. And this is the requirement of a just society to tolerate the intolerant. Otherwise, that society would itself be intolerant and thus unjust. However, Rawls also says that the freedom of the intolerant can be restricted. So when we're talking about the intolerant, of course, we're talking about people who say, I don't want to tolerate um, abortion, I don't want to tolerate your um, atheism, I don't want to tolerate uh, women dressing in particular ways. So they're intolerant. They don't just want to say, I'm happy to dress like this, believe these things, and that's good enough for me that I live in a society that's free to do that. They're actually intolerant of other people doing what they don't believe. So Rawls says you have to tolerate those people, otherwise you, you are yourself not tolerant. But then he says that the freedom of the intolerant can be restricted where the tolerant sincerely and with reason believe their own security and that of the institutions of liberty that give effect to tolerance are in danger. So what I want to ask you is should this woman be tolerated? <laughs> Concerned Women of America. Concerned I looked up um, America. before America. <laughs> no, the scientists problem. who question evolution are being censored out, are being blackballed out of the scientific community, but, and, not, and being told that the rest of the world cannot listen to them. Yeah. So I let that clip go for a while because there's so much in it, isn't there? Um, so. There are a couple of questions there, and the, the broad one, you know, the broad sort of banner is, should this woman be tolerated? But I guess I thought it would be really interesting to ask you, like, I struggled to watch that. Um, I had to walk away several times, <laughs> take some deep breaths, and then return to the scene. Um, so I, I wondered if you could distill, um, and then I'll tell you what I thought was so frustrating about it, if you could distill what was so frustrating about that it encounter. It did get worse, and... and um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Because um, I, 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 w I went on to, 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 exp to try to persuade her to actually, I almost said, come to the museum with me and I'll show you the evidence. But it, she, she developed a kind of refrain, yes. which went, show me the evidence, show me the evidence. Yes. Um, and and uh, it, it was intensely frustrating. But Richard, isn't the problem that we tell people, look at the evidence yourself, evaluate it yourself, yes. and there she was doing it. Well, she, she, she wasn't because she didn't actually go to the museum to look. Uh, um, <laughs> um, she, she, was well, she said she just saw drawings and there weren't any carcasses. Which, of course, is false. I mean, the, 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 I forget where that was. Was it in the Washington or New York? Oh, anyway, there are mm -hmm. first-class museums in both those, those cities where there's in, enormous quantities of physical material. Um, but don't we have to contend, I think, with that problem that we say to people, and indeed I think you wrote a beautiful letter to your daughter, Juliet, where you say to her, it's so important that you not just take what people hand you. Yes. You must ask for the evidence and yes. evaluate it. So what's going wrong okay, here? Okay, I mean, you, you, you have to be careful about that because, of course, not all of us have the time or actually the expertise to evaluate the evidence ourselves. I mean, I as a biologist, am not capable of evaluating the evidence that physicists adduce um, for their view of the universe. And so there is an element of trust in authority, and I don't like using the word authority, but I think you can kind of do it in the case of science, because the methods of science are such that we know that even in those sciences which we're not capable of evaluating ourselves, we know that other, in this case, physicists are. So we know that when a, a, a fact has been widely established in the physics literature, we know that uh, experimental results have been repeated and repeated and repeated, if they're important, if they really matter, uh, no result will be allowed to stand 
uh, unless it's been looked at by physicists from all over the world. I mean, in Japan, in India, in America, in Australia. But it, as you say, it is about trust and authority, and we have had some difficulties with our peer-reviewed journals. It's we've true. had some fraud. It's true. We've I mean, had that, issues around right. the validity I mean, of the methods. We've got to admit that. We've got to admit that, that, that there has been scientific fraud. Uh, and it's um, uh, one thing to say about that is that in, in science, perhaps more than in any other profession, uh, lying about, about your findings is the cardinal sin. It's, uh, it's, if, if you're a lawyer or a politician... <laughs> um, the profession's held in the lowest esteem. Well, yeah. it, it, it's, it's part of the job. Um, <laughs> You, you have to, um, or at, at very least, it's part of the job to, um, to spin the facts in a way that's favorable to a point of view that you've been paid to advocate. If, if you're a lawyer, that's absolutely straightforward. You're paid to advocate a certain point of view. And the whole system, in the adversarial system at least, it's a kind of tug of war. Um, uh, a lawyer is paid to, to make the best case possible for, for that point of view, and other lawyers paid to make the best case possible for that and um, they if they don't actually lie they do spin the most plausible th story they can um, I was very shocked to meet a young lawyer in America uh, she was a defense lawyer and she told me with some glee that uh, she had hired a private detective who had uncovered who had found evidence which proved beyond any possible doubt that her client was innocent of murder. And I said, well, that's wonderful, congratulations. What would you have done if your private detective had found evidence that proved him guilty? And she said, I would have suppressed it. She said, it's up to the prosecution to find their own evidence. And that, of course, is different to academics because our that, job is to right. try to get to the that's truth. That's right. Now, if a scientist did the equivalent and was, and was discovered, he would be drummed out of the profession forever. Mm. Um, it, it is the cardinal sin. It happens, but it's not part of the culture. It's, it's, it's something that the culture abhors. Um, so that's f fraud. Um, then there and, are the... Sorry, can I just yeah. interrupt for one second, though, just to offer something? Because I think this issue about expertise is one of the things that was really bothering me about this. So you yes. have such a high level of expertise, and yet she was having an argument with you about yes, okay. what evidence was. I, wouldn't, I would not wish to pull rank in that, in that sense. That's why I kept saying go to the museum and look at the evidence. But I, wouldn't it be like the equivalent? I, thought, I was trying to think, now what would the equivalent be that she might understand? And I thought maybe the equivalent would be, let's say her father had been a car mechanic for 50 years, Yes. right? And I rock up and I say, um, oh, you're looking at that car that's really broken down. What, what do you think's wrong with it? And, you know, the guy goes... Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure it's the carburetor or whatever he says. And then I go, I don't know anything about cars, but I don't think it's the carburetor. Yes, quite. I think it's the, the indicator. Yes, yes. And then you say, no, he'll say, no, 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 it's the carburetor. You can see, blah, blah. Show me the evidence. I don't think it's the carburetor. I think it's the indicator. Yeah. That, that was what I was seeing. Yes. And yet, as you rightly identify, if you trust, if, you, if to understand the evidence, you have to trust experts, we are back in that, un that shaky not, not, land not of quite. authority. I mean, that, that, I think that's almost right. But, but there, there is the fact that we, 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 we don't trust the expert because he is Professor so-and-so FRS. What we, what we trust is the system of other physicists, assuming that we're talking to a physicist because I don't know any physics. I, I don't respect what he says because he's a professor of physics with a, when he's a fellow of the Royal Society. I trust it because I know that there's a whole community of physicists who will jump on him uh, if, if, if he's got it wrong. But what about paradigm shifts? I mean, sometimes okay. a whole area of science can agree on something, and then one odd piece of evidence that people do validate and test over and over again comes, and then everybody goes, oh my god, the whole thing we thought was right that, was wrong, and the whole, yeah, there's a shift. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a very important refinement of the, of the idea, and, and that, that, of course, is, is, is correct. Um, somebody once quipped that science proceeds funeral by funeral. Um, <laughs> as, uh, as, old, as, old, as old theories old, and old, old theorists old, old scientists fall, die, right. die off. Um, but um, yes, I mean, paradigm shifts and Thomas Kuhn and so on, is that, that, that is important. We can't, we can't forget that. But 
it's, it's at least not quite as bad as saying we just argue from authority. Mm. Uh, there's, it's, it's better, it's, it's it's better, better than, than that. that. Yes. And is she someone who is probably the best um, evidence we have for the need for science education? Because I, I struggle to think of the things that were making me mental about watching that, and I, I do need to say to you that I watched it about three times because, of course, I knew I was going to be presenting yeah. it. Um, <laughs> but one of them was the fact that she kept repeating this demand for evidence yes. and then you kept saying but there is evidence yes. and then you'd explain what to me was clearly recognizable as evidence yes. and you were clearly recognizable as somebody who would recognize evidence and yet she didn't know that what she was asking for she was in fact receiving so is she a good example of why if we don't teach people science they can run around squawking, I want the evidence, I want the evidence, but they actually have no idea what they're talking I about. I fear that, that, that she was a good example of somebody who knows what is true because it's in Holy Scripture. And anything that contradicts that has just got to be wrong. Uh, there are much, much more knowledgeable people than her who, I mean, I could point to one called Kurt Wise, who is an American geologist, paleontologist. He has a a degree in geology from Chicago University and, and a PhD in paleontology from Harvard. Uh, and so he knows a lot of geology, he knows a lot of paleontology, but his upbringing is as a young earth creationist. So he believes the world is only 6,000 years old. And he actually wrote a, a rather remarkably honest uh, testament. He said, uh, well, f first of all, he said that he, he told a story of how he took a Bible and a pair of scissors and he went right through the Bible, cutting out every page of every verse of the Bible which would have to go if he accepted the scientific worldview in which he'd been educated at the University of Chicago and at Harvard. And he said, by the time I'd got through from Genesis to Revelation, there was so little left of Holy Scripture that it just fell to bits. And then he said, it was that night in great sorrow that I tossed into the flames. I thought he was going to say tossed into the flames his, his Bible. tattered Bible, but yeah. no. I tossed into the flames all my hopes and dreams of being a teacher of science. He'd wanted all his life to be a teacher of science, but it contradicted Holy Scripture, so he tossed his, his dreams into the fire. And he then went on to say, if all the evidence in but the universe... But my biggest concern oh, is sorry, that evangelical... Oh, sorry, 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 go off. He then went on to say, if right. all the evidence in the universe pointed to an old earth, I would be the first to accept it, but I would still be a young earth creationist, because that is what Holy Scripture teaches. Now, that is an educated person... Sorry, I'm looking for something in particular. ...testifying to, this. to the power of childhood indoctrination and admitting that he would be absolutely unshakable, even if he admitted that the evidence showed that he was wrong. And in fact, this organization is uh, one that you're in coalition with, isn't it? Yes, the Openly Secular Campaign is one that uh, my foundation, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, the American branch of the foundation, is now, this is our kind of flagship enterprise at the, at the moment, it's very, very important in America, and I suspect it's much less important in Australia, that secular people, people who don't believe in any divine power, uh, atheists, agnostics, secularists, are shunned and discriminated against in a way that gay people used to be. And uh, the polls show that atheists in America are Despised is probably not too strong a word. Um, they're, they're mistrusted. Uh, they're mistrusted because people think you need religion in order to be moral. They're mistrusted to the point where a very substantial number of Americans have said that they would not, under any circumstances, vote for an atheist, however well qualified she was in all other respects. Uh, and indeed, it is a fact that of all the 535 members of the United States Congress, not a single one is openly secular. Every single one of them professes religious belief, which cannot be true. Statistically speaking, that's got to be nonsense. <laughs> um, so uh, the openly secular campaign is a consciousness-raising exercise. 
borrowing the phrase consciousness raising from feminists where it was so incredibly, still is incredibly uh, successful. Consciousness raising exercise to say atheists, agnostics, secularists, non-believers are nice people just like you, just like the person next door. They're the, 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 the waiter, they're the taxi driver, the bus driver, um, the lawyer, the doctor. Uh, they're your best friend. You, you don't realize it because in America people don't own up to being atheists, at least in certain parts of, of, of America. Mm. So, so it's a destigmatizing kind of a campaign. It's a sti exactly, it's, it's destigmatizing. And one of the things that we're doing is getting short YouTube videos of people, just ordinary people, nice people, smiling people, friendly people, um, <laughs> who don't have horns and a tail. I was just thinking yeah. that it really reminds me of that kind of idea that, you know, Jews have horns and yeah. like it really is a, a, yes. a, a, yeah. a process which of course you can do now with video because um, I've looked at some of the videos. You looked at, you looked at some of them yeah, and getting, some of them. getting celebrities mm. to, to do it as, as, as well. And so in terms of the design of that logo, which you may or may not have anything to do with, what was the connection, and, and you were starting to speak to it, so I just thought I'd well, flip to it, um, between, between non-belief and science. Yes, I, as you rightly said, I mean, it, it's a, the, the logo is, is a DNA uh, double helix bent into the shape of a heart, meaning love, meaning, meaning um, friend, friendship, uh, human fellowship, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so what was well, that? Well, I guess my question is, can you be an atheist um, and have no faith in the scientific method as the only or the best way of knowing things about the world? And can you be a scientist and have faith in God? Okay. Um, well, clearly you can be a scientist and have faith in God in the sense that many, not many, but some scientists do. Uh, you need to be a little bit careful to ask them what they really believe. It will often turn out to be a sort of vague spirituality. Uh, which, not necessarily un under that word, I would uh, own up to myself. I, would, I sort of feel uh, a great surge of emotion when looking up at the Milky Way, say. And some people call that spiritual, which is then confused with religion. And so many scientists who say they're religious actually turn out to be religious only in that Einsteinian sense. Um, there are a few I think it's, it's about 10% of the Fellows of the Royal Society, 10% of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States who do believe properly in a personal God in the way that Einstein did not. And that 10% does need explaining, but it is only 10%. Now the other question you asked is can an atheist not believe in science? Yeah, because I'm just trying to draw out this, yes. this conflation um, of the two. Are they really exactly, you know, the same? Do they always have to go oh, they, No, they're not, they're not exactly the same. It would be pretty, I mean, I've heard people ask whether you can be an atheist who does not believe in evolution. Um, that would be quite hard uh, because you would be left with no explanation for the gigantic fact of life um, with its powerful, overwhelmingly powerful, overpowering illusion of design. Uh, life is simply dripping with apparent design. And it, you've only got to look at an eye, as the theologians so love to do, um, to see design written all over it. And if you don't have God and you don't have evolution, you kind of left without anything, with, with, I mean... Blissful ignorance. Per, per, perhaps you just don't have any curiosity. I mean, yes. perhaps you, <laughs> um, but I can't imagine how anybody... I mean, it, it, it's true that before Darwin there were atheists, like David Hume, mm. um, but he recognized that the, the apparent design of living things was not a good argument for a god, but he di didn't have any alternative. That, that had to wait for Darwin. Mm. Okay, and it's about atheism and secularism, and I, and I have a feeling the United States is probably going to figure a little bit in this answer, but I suppose when I, you are very fond of, of, you know, not being asked to define things, because you, you often say, you know, there's a perfectly good dictionary, go and have a look at it, so I did, um, and so what I came to was something which is pretty much how I'd understood it, which is atheism is a lack of faith that there is a god or gods, um, which is a simplistic definition, but there you go. Um, and secularism is the political proposition that church and state must be kept separate. 
So secularism is really a political proposition, atheism is a belief, and yet we can see, and you can see in the openly secular thing, that those two things are being put together. And so again, I have the same question. Can, a per can you be a person of faith um, and support a secular society? Well, yes, I mean, this is a matter of definition, I suspect, and I subscribe to the definition of secularism which you have just given, exactly. Uh, and I suspect that the, use, the common usage in Britain, and I now learn probably in Australia, is that. But I seem to be learning that in America, secularism tends to be slightly more shifted the, by definition towards atheism. Because atheist is such a loaded... I'm not sure what the reason would her. be. What, which dictionary did you look that up in? Do you remember? Um, I think it was the Wikipedia dictionary. Ah, okay. <laughs> Well, um, uh, I actually um, don't know whether this is really right. I've been, I've been told that, that in America, secular, secular has a slightly more shifted towards mm. atheist meaning. Um, my th understanding, which is a, possibly a British and Australian un understanding, is that it is precisely the belief that religion should be kept out of politics, that there should be a total separation uh, between church and state, mm. in which case the answer to your question is a, is a resounding yes, a religious person can be a secularist. And I suppose my, the reason I'm bringing it up is because I, I worry sometimes when we conflate the terms that we miss out on those people you were speaking about before, those um, sort of... Uh, rational, reasonable, non-intrusive religious people who in fact were one of, you know, the whole notion of religious freedom came originally from religious people yes. because there was a worry of, of minority religions yes. being trampled by majority religions. So do we need to be careful not to wind the words up so I that think, yes. we don't push away those um, sympathetic religious people who also support the secular state. Yes, and, and if, you, if you go back to the founding fathers of America in the 18th century, um, they were secularists in the sense that you and I are, are using it. Uh, some of them were probably atheists as well. Jefferson was probably an atheist. Mm. Um, but you don't have to be. But, but, but you can be a minority yes. religion, for instance. So where I was growing up in the United States, we used to have a fight. There was a fight every year about a nativity scene. So every year, the Christians in my hometown wanted to put a nativity scene in the public square. It was literally the public square. And every year, it wasn't atheists um, who were fighting it, although I'm sure they would have been on side, and maybe they just weren't an organized force because I'm ancient. So this is many years ago. But it was the Jews in the, in the, in the town, and probably also you know, the handful of Hindi, Hindus and, and Muslims who were fighting it so hard because they felt like that public square needed to stay free of all religion yes. for their own distinct faith to continue to have the standing and um, strength that they, need, they wanted it to have. Yes, and, and, and hence the tendency to use the euphemism holiday season rather than Christmas. <laughs> I remember when I first heard Christopher Hitchens say that, um, I remember where I was, because it clarified for me in like a lightning moment the difference between cultural respect and respect for other people's faith and religion, which is something I, I was really raised in, in and on, um, and the importance of speaking up robustly about defending the institutions that ensure tolerance. Um, and I know that quotes and retweets are not necessarily endorsements, so I guess I just wanted to ask you, although I assume I know the answer, do you endorse and agree with Yes, I, I love that quote, and, and it's, it's very, you could hear it in his voice. Um, Stephen Fry said something rather similar. You, you know what a sort of lovable national treasure he, he is. His, his version was somewhat uncharacteristic. It, it, it was something like, you're offended, well, so fucking what? <laughs> <laughs> Which is a bit pithier, but yeah, pretty much yeah, the same um, thing. <laughs> yes, I mean, it, one doesn't want to offend. One doesn't go out of one's way to offend. But on the other hand, to say I'm offended is not an argument for anything. Um, yeah. it, it, nothing follows from it. And, and so it should never be advanced as an argument. And so I, I, I must confess that I laugh when I see both Christopher's and uh, Stephen Fry's 
Uh, well, it's sort of a version of sticks and stones, isn't it? It's sort of saying that to have robust debates, we're going to need to both be willing to give offence if that's the way the other person chooses to take it, and also to take what we may feel offended by in order that we can fight about and not be afraid to engage in robust arguments yes. about the things that really matter. Yes, I mean, sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words can never hurt me. Words can hurt you, and I think we have to be a little bit careful about, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to hurt people's fe feelings, but that doesn't mean that to say you've hurt my feelings is an argument. It, 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 if, if, so, if somebody says you've hurt my feelings, then I will say, I'm, I, I wouldn't say it so robustly as, as as Christopher Hitchens or Stephen Fry, um, I, might, I might say, well, I'm very sorry to have hurt your feelings, but what is your argument? Mm. Um, so uh, I, I don't want to in, insult people. Um, I mean, just sort of say, you know, you're, you've got an ugly face or something. Is it, is it, um, well, that's exactly where I was going with all of this, because yeah. there is such a fine line, isn't there? So on the one hand, we probably all are in, you know, um, vigorous agreement that we agree with the Christopher Hitchens statement and like I said it was very very important to me but at the same time you've recently for instance issued a statement which I mentioned before with Ophelia Benson where you talked about the need for ethical disagreement that leaves out brawling, death and rape threats, vulgar epithets, insults of appearance because things were getting pretty out of hand in terms of the online community yes. weren't they? We don't, I mean, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. And uh, I, I um, beat this often enough because quite frequently, I mean, I'm very, very exercised at the moment about Islam. And very frequently, I will say very negative things about Islam, only to find that people are taking that as a personal attack on individual Muslims, which of course it isn't. Um, it's an attack on beliefs, it's an attack on a, a system of beliefs which, if taken literally, if taken seriously, is pernicious and has terrible effects. But it's not like saying you've got an ugly face, but yet an awful lot of people treat it as though it was. An awful lot of people are so bound up with their beliefs, their religious beliefs in this particular case, it could be other kinds of beliefs, they're so bound up with it that they almost hear it as though it was like you've got an ugly face. Mm. Um, and I, I do insist that it's not that. It's, it's, it's nothing like saying a, per, a personal insult. But haven't you been offended too? I mean, my understanding was that one of the, the sort of things that was going on in your own um, blog world, where eventually there was a decision to start to moderate things more tightly, was that there was quite a lot of, um, you said there was something rotten in internet culture and you expressed concern over images posted of you in which your face was depicted as a slack-jawed turd-in-the-mouth mug. So... I don't remember that. But, but, <laughs> How um, could you forget? But I, I guess that was interesting to me in the sense that it, it, it is... Um, there is such a fine line here between robust debate and not worrying or taking offence when we're, we're talking yeah, about really important yes. things, and yet, and yet. Well, um, we, do, we do have moderation on richarddawkins.net, which is the website of, of my foundation, and the moderation is never to censor uh, a proper expression of opinion or an argument, but it is to censor uh, personal insults. So um, if, if somebody on our blog, on our w website, says you're a fucking douchebag, um, that is censored. Um, it's, because it's not... Um, it's, it's, it's not, not a valid argument it's not an in argument, technique. No, exactly. <laughs> that's right. Um, so in other words, the, the difference you're drawing, and I think that that's a really helpful one, is that there's a difference between insulting, there's a difference between threatening, because we all know freedom of speech, but you can't yell fire in a crowded movie house. The, so we, we can speak rigorously about ideas that matter to us, you know, where do we come from, where does the world come from, people can get offended by the rigorous exchange of ideas, that we can't do anything about. But the minute you get into ad hominem attacks, you know, personal attacks, threats, you've stepped over the line. Exactly, and, but unfortunately there are people who, who, who hear 
the legitimate one, which is an argument, as a as personal an insult. insult. And there are people who will say, um, when, when people insult the Quran, we feel physical pain. I mean, that's, that's nonsense. You don't feel physical pain. If you think that's physical pain, you need to experience what physical pain is really like. Um, the, the Quran is just a book. But, well, one thing that you've said recently, though, Richard, just, just to keep drawing yeah. out this distinction, because I do think it is very important, and in fact, in light of our comments, I think it's particularly important, um, is that you, you've said recently that you feel muzzled by climate of bullying, that in fact the bullying has become so severe yes. online that you felt that there was a climate of intransigent thought police, which is highly influential in the sense that it suppresses people like me. So to me, that sounds like that isn't a complaint just about people arguing in invalid ways and insulting you and, and putting depictions of you up that are insulting. It's really actually people coming down on you so hard and in such an organized swarm kind of fashion that it feels like you have to be, you feel muzzled by that. If what, if the consequence of expressing an opinion in sober language uh, is that there is an immediate uh, downpouring, a feeding frenzy of insults of you're a fucking douchebag variety, that is a deterrent. What if people are swarming you but they're not saying you're a douchebag, they're, but they're actually criticizing you over and over. That's for, completely different. I mean, that's, that, that's absolutely acceptable and, f and fine. But uh, be because we all agree that the, um, that the expletive insult, that, 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 that those sorts of words can, can hurt. I mean, the, the, um, uh, um, of, in, in the same way as you've got an ugly face can, can hurt. If you, if you know that to express an opinion uh, in, in sober, proper, uh, argumentative form doesn't just result in counter-argument, which would be absolutely acceptable, but results in a frenzy of insults of the, you've got an ugly face variety, but, or worse, um, then that is a deterrent. And, and do you think that's in the eye of the beholder too? Because I'm just going to get up this next okay. slide. Um, so. This one's from Blue Beck, um, and I think, and where she seemed to be coming from, and, and it is just a tweet, so I'm, I'm really just guessing, is that she was responding to this idea that somehow um, criticism, if there's a lot of it, um, can feel to another person like a muzzling or no, like I mean, censorship. I, I, um, well, okay, so that's good. I mean, I think I mean, that's I, actually I've quite said a that good again, thing. Again and again. Yes. Um, Criticism, honest criticism, se serious criticism. Uh, no, I mean, I'm all for, for that, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay, well, I think that's great. Yeah. So one of the things that, um, actually, I might just, where are we on time? Someone give me the time. Yeah, okay. So we're going to wind it up, so I'm going to skip this one. Um, and I, we've already seen this one. And this is the last one we'll do. So we'll talk about education, because it's a huge passion of mine. It's a huge passion of yours. Can you see it over there or no? I, I, can, I, okay. I can see it. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a couple of tweets we've had about asking Richard to talk about education. This one is, what is our collective responsibility to educate the children of creationists? And by what means can this be achieved in real terms? Um, and that's, of course, our education problem in a nutshell. Um, how do we convey a scientific worldview to children while respecting the rights of their parents? And then this third one from Lydia Fusco, how do you see environmental education featuring in the curriculum 20 years from now? How do you envision the schools of tomorrow given trends and the impact of technology? So Richard Dawkins, education, discuss. Like you, I'm passionate about education uh, and I feel terrible about children being denied the beauty of a scientific education. Uh, in the 21st century, more than ever before, children have the opportunity of learning the immense beauty of the scientific worldview, which is stunning. I've said it before, that any child of about 12 with a, de with a decent education could give Aristotle a tutorial. 
and thrill Aristotle to the core of his being. Aristotle, one of the cleverest people who ever lived, one of the most knowledgeable people of his time who, 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 who ever, ever lived, but yet because we, we now live in the 21st century, a well-educated child of 12 would be able to tell Aristotle things that would blow his mind. And yet there are children who are being homeschooled or schooled in inferior schools which are teaching them arrant nonsense about the world being 6,000 years old, the sort of things that Wendy Wright believes. Um, that is a tragedy, and yet we have to balance our horror at that with the rights of parents, as I think it was Russell Blackford um, said in that tweet. Um, we don't want to be dictatorial, we don't want to be sort of fascistic, seizing children and putting them but isn't in... isn't the truth that parents don't really have rights, they have responsibilities? Yes, I mean, I, I, I think that's right, but if, but if you tried to... If you, if you, if you compelled um, parents to, se to send their children to schools where, they, where the parents were... Um, uh, felt that their rights were being, were, were being trampled. We have to sort of recognize that. And, and I, I find it very hard to know quite what the answer is because I'm often accused of, of wanting to kind of seize, seize children and, and bring them up in collective farms and, and, and <laughs> things like, like that. Um, I mean, in, in, in Britain, I expect you have it in Australia as well, uh, we, we have uh, school inspectors who, who go around schools um, listening in on, on lessons and checking up on how, how the teaching is going and things. I suppose you could extend that. You, could, um, you, you probably could, without being too dictatorial about it, uh, pounce on schools which were teaching obvious scientific falsehoods. And isn't part of it how we just separate things out? So in other words, one of the big debates has not been about the teaching of the creation story in religious class insofar as people go to Sunday school and of course we have a, a terrible problem here where we actually have religious people who are enabled to go right into the, the classroom in the public schools. It was really about teaching religion in the science class. And in, and in the same way, couldn't we um, talk about there being a universal public education, something that everybody has to have rather than things people shouldn't have? And that goes back to the Wendy Wright video, because if she actually had a better scientific education, a better understanding, sure, she might have ended up like your um, colleague who yeah. had, to, had yeah. to cut up the Bible and then, and then yeah. throw away the science book. Yeah. But at least she would have faced, potentially, that great moment of reckoning, and she wouldn't have been saying to you, where's the evidence, where's the evidence, Quite. where's the evidence, yes. when you kept giving yeah. it to her. Well, there have been one or two celebrated cases in Britain. There's a school in the north of England, uh, near, near Newcastle, um, Gateshead, uh, where young earth creationism is being taught in, in science. And I got together with the then Bishop of Oxford, and we rounded up uh, half a dozen bishops and half a dozen fellows of the Royal Society, and we, we wrote a joint letter of protest, and we sent it to Tony Blair, who was then the Prime Minister, uh, and um, got brushed off by him, saying that um, diversity is a virtue. And so, in, in the name of diversity... But isn't, isn't that, you know, you're entitled to, to your own values, but you're not entitled to your own facts? Exactly. Um, yes, exactly. So, that was very unsatisfactory. and. Well, Tony Blair was very unsatisfactory. So, so. <laughs>